God bless us and the Virgin protect us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Once again, I want to explicitly acknowledge my debt and gratitude to Our Lady of Fatima. She has to get the credit for anything that's good or true or beautiful in these Novena conferences, and all the faults are my own. Ave Maria Purissima. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In our last conference, we considered some prophetic marks Cardinal Pacelli made before he became Pope Pius XII, that communism is the most visible of the organs of subversion against the church, that philosophy, science, law, teaching, the arts, media, literature, theater, and religion, everything that's spiritual will be invaded by the organs of subversion, that the message of Our Lady of Fatima is a divine warning against the suicide of modifying the faith, liturgy, theology, and soul of the church, that a day will come when the civilized world will deny its God, when the church will doubt as Peter doubted, she'll be tempted to believe that man has become God and that his son is only a symbol, a philosophy like so many others. And in churches, Christians will search for the red lamp where Jesus awaits them like the sinful woman crying out before the empty tomb, where have they taken him? And we asked, hasn't that day already come? Are we not living in that day where the church is doubting as Peter doubted? Or even worse, we gave examples of some of the absolutely shocking statements found in the sermons of the current occupant of the See of, of Peter. We saw that while walking the Vatican Gardens, Pius XII saw the miracle of the sun on four separate occasions. This was an absolute proof given directly to the Pope that Our Lady truly came to Fatima and their message is truly urgent. It was a sign a request could finally be accomplished. And she was there to give them the strength and the grace on the occasion of the Declaration of the Assumption to take that opportunity to make the consecration of Russia to Immaculate Heart. We considered the symbolism seen in the sky during the Declaration of the Dogma of the Assumption. The sun and moon were visible just over the cross on the Dome of St. Peter's. We saw that was evocative of two lines in sacred scripture, a line from the Canticle of Canticles, who is she that comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array, which has traditionally been understood to refer to the Blessed Virgin, and a line from the Apocalypse. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. We saw at one at the same time this conjunction of heavenly symbols seen in the sky during the ceremony, right over the site of the martyrdom of St. Peter, with the sun and the crescent of the moon visible beside it, just above the cross on the dome of the basilica, reminds us of the martyrdom of the Pope. We saw it reminds us of Our Lady's fidelity at the foot of the cross. We saw that it reminds us of her military might, so to speak, that she would be the protector and defender of the Holy Father in all his battles. We saw it reminds us of her immense charity. We saw that it reminds us of the fact that she's the mediatrix of all graces. We saw that it reminds us of her unspeakable beauty we saw that it reminds us of the fact that she's the woman of the apocalypse, the virgin of Revelation. We saw that just as God sent Jonah with a terrifying warning that his judgment was looming over the pagan city of Nineveh, so also he sent Our Lady to Fatima with a terrifying warning that his judgment was looming over the whole world. We saw there was one huge, immense, incalculable difference, and that difference was that the pagan Ninevites heeded Jonah's warning and repented. But almost no one has heeded Our Lady's warnings and repented. We saw that the messages of Our Lady of Fatima are contingent prophecies that contain blessings of peace and salvation for heeding her requests, the warnings of destruction and damnation for not heeding her requests. We saw that Our Lady gave specific warnings to mankind and she made specific requests. We saw that in terms of warnings, Our Lady showed the children a terrifying vision of hell. We saw that she specifically warned that if people did not cease offending God, a worse war would break out, and God would punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and the Holy Father. We saw that she also specifically warned that if her requests were not heeded, that Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church, that the good would be martyred, that the Holy Father would have much to suffer, and that various nations would be annihilated. We saw that she did a miracle of unprecedented and biblical proportions, the miracle of the Son, a miracle which points to a corresponding message of unprecedented and biblical importance, a miracle which is very sobering, symbolic warning that God's judgment is looming, the end of the world is at hand. 
We saw that neither the leaders in the civil society of the church had paid much attention to her warnings. In spite of the fact that it, isn't even po it isn't even possible to conceive of more serious warnings than hell, wars, famines, persecutions of the church, nations annihilated, and the end of the world. And as a consequence, on August 19, 1931, our Lord appeared to Sister Lucia with a terrible warning that since his ministers were following the example of the King of France and delaying the execution of his command to consecrate Russia, that they would fall into misfortune. In effect, warning that as a consequence of not consecrating, consecrating Russia in a timely fashion, her errors will spread and take root, which is exactly what we've seen. And in the resulting societal chaos, ministers of the church, including the Pope, will follow the King of France into misfortune. By considering the historical context of the execution of the French king in the midst of the social chaos of the French Revolution, we saw that this warning seems to indicate that the ministers of the church will suffer and die, most likely by execution. This would very likely take place during the catastrophic chastisements resulting from ignoring Our Lady's request. We saw that in response to Jonah's warning of imminent destruction, the pagan citizens of Nineveh actually repented and did penance, and then the king, by his proclamation, made every effort to support and enforce that repentance. But in response to a far more amazing, completely terrifying public, pre-announced miracle from heaven, the miracle of the Son in Fatima, and Our Lady's accompanying message, that over this last century, the response from Catholics in terms of actual repenting and doing penance has been negligible. We saw that given this unbelievably feeble response to Our Lady's warnings and requests, we shouldn't be particularly surprised that the popes haven't yet done the consecration of Russia to Immaculate Heart. We saw that during the 1980s, the miracle of the sun occurred year after year at Tre Fontane. We saw that in regards to the fact that the witnesses could look directly at the sun with ease, Cornelius the Lapidae, the great commentator, states that the sun, moon, and stars are dimmed when the leaders of the church of the world depart from justice and holiness to depravity and wickedness. We saw that the fact that this miracle was repeated over and over and over again at a Catholic shrine in Rome is indicative that the rulers of the church are being symbolically indicted by this heavenly phenomenon. We saw it's a repeated symbolic indication they have departed from justice and holiness to depravity and wickedness. We saw that in the Old Testament, as well as in ancient Jewish writings, the partial or complete darkening of the sun, moon, or stars is a sign that the people have violated their covenant obligations to God and are undergoing judgment. That it's a sign they've turned away from God and they haven't been keeping the commandments. We saw that the fact this miracle was repeated over and over and over again at Tre Fontane was indicative of grave violations of specific commandments. We saw that the cave at Tre Fontane had been a place of great sin. It had been used by prostitutes, and the remains of an aborted baby had been buried there. It was the very site where Bruno had been writing his heretical and blasphemous sermon. In other words, we saw this was a site of sins against the marriage covenant, a site of sexual sins and perversions, a site of sins of contraception and abortion, a site of heresy and blasphemy. We saw that by the 1980s, when these miracles were reoccurring, all the sins associated with this site had become widespread throughout much of the church and the world. In other words, in the dimming of the sun's brightness, we saw a symbolic warning of judgment on corrupt church leaders who have departed from justice and holiness to depravity and wickedness. We saw a symbolic warning of judgment on the Catholic people as a whole who haven't kept the commandments, who have turned away from God to sins against the marriage covenant, sexual sins, contraception, abortion, perversions, heresy, and blasphemy. We saw that according to St. Vincent Ferrer, heaven often puts a warning in the sky when a great and heavy affliction is about to come upon the world, so that the people might either advert the punishment through prayers and penance, or might prepare themselves to suffer the affliction. And so these repeated miracles were forewarnings of great and heavy afflictions, meant to encourage the people through prayer, penance, and amendment of their lives to either turn back the hand of God or failing that to prepare themselves for upcoming afflictions. We saw that according to tradition, the moving and spinning of the sun is a sign of the end of the world. And we also saw that God alters the fixed patterns of sun, moon, and stars to indicate judgment on those who have wrongly altered his moral patterns, especially through idolatry. We asked what sort of idolatrous behavior might be incurring the judgment of God. We saw that in essence, an idolater is someone who in his life has dethroned God, so to speak, and put something else in his place. We saw the idolater has literally put something else before God, that in the life of the idolater, the true God is not as important as some mere creature. We saw the idolater actually serves that mere creature in place of the true God. We saw that the mere creature has become the God of the idolater. We saw that in our society, idolatry is actually the most common religion, 
and that the pews in virtually every Catholic church are full of idolaters. We saw that in our society, the idol, the mere creature that is most commonly served, is the self. We saw that an immense number of people, practically speaking, have turned away from service of the true God, and in its place, they serve themselves and their own selfish interests. We saw they serve their own pleasures according to their own convenience and their own appetites, be it sins against the marriage covenant, like separation, divorce, and remarriage, be it sexual sins of any stripe, ranging from watching mainstream television shows or porn to engaging in out-and-out -out fornication, adultery, or perversions. They use contraception without a thought. They may find abortion distasteful, distasteful or even wrong, but at the end of the day, no one should be punished. It's a choice, and who am I to judge? And on and on and on it goes. In other words, they literally put themselves before God, their law unto themselves, and we saw that if these people do observe the commandments, it's a matter of convenience or custom and not conviction. We saw that Trefontane is the site where St. Paul was beheaded. It's a burial site of St. Zeno and his 10,203 companions, Catholic slaves who were martyred by the savage Roman government. It's a site where St. Bernard had a famous vision of souls being released from purgatory by virtue of the Mass, he was saying, and then be escorted by angels up a staircase to heaven. We saw that as a consequence, Trefontani brings to mind a series of events. We saw it brings to mind the beheading of the king and the martyrdom and slaughter of so many his subjects during the French Revolution, that it brings to mind the killing of the pope and the martyrdom and slaughter of so many priests, religious and faithful, and the visions given to Bruno by the Virgin of Revelation. And we saw it brings to mind the killing of the pope, bishops, priests, religious and faithful, with the angels sprinkling the blood of the martyrs on the souls, making their way to heaven, seen in the vision published of the Third Secret. When we considered Bruno, we saw a communist. We saw a spy who had portrayed himself as one thing while really being another. We saw a vociferous enemy of the church. We saw a blaspheming heretic who hated Our Lady. We saw a man who didn't scruple to steal from priests and who made a point of physically and verbally abusing priests. We saw a man who had sworn an oath to murder the Pope and had gone so far as to buy the weapon and choose the date. We saw a man who didn't scruple at all to violate his marriage covenant by adultery. We saw a thug and a wife beater. All in all, we saw a man who had actively, deliberately, and wholeheartedly subscribed to the errors of Russia and a vicious lifestyle. And when we considered the instantaneous conversion of Bruno, we saw that it was both a promise and a warning. We saw that his conversion was a visible and concrete example of what Our Lady can do with someone that's completely and utterly dominated by the errors of Russia and a vicious lifestyle. We saw that she could instantly convert someone like that from the very depths of sin and depravity to the heights of Catholic fervor and charity. And we saw his conversion was a sign, a promise of what she could do and would do with a whole nation of people dominated by those same errors and vicious lifestyles, if only mankind and the Pope would heed her requests. We saw that Our Lady went to Rome to beg the hierarchy to listen to her Fatima message, that the presence of someone like Bruno was a warning, that although Our Lady had been intervening, that although Our Lady had stopped Bruno in his tracks, that although Our Lady had converted him, that although she held back a man whose plan was to kill the Pope, if they continued to follow the examples of the King of France, then Our Lady was no longer going to be able to hold back the arm of her son, which is exactly what she told Bruno when she said that, for the sake of justice, I have to let go of my son's hand, precisely because justice has to be fulfilled. We briefly noted that the miracle of the son was an absolutely unique and unparalleled historical event, a miracle of literally biblical proportions, and that almost 100 years later there was another miracle of the sun in virtually the same place, that on May 4th of last year in the Portuguese town of Orem, the very town where the three children were taken when they were kidnapped, Our Lady gave another warning, yet all this has been practically ignored. We saw that the pilgrim statue of Our Lady of Fatima had visited Orem and had been venerated throughout the night in the church, and then in the morning as they processed out of the church with Our Lady, a miracle began which lasted about 15 minutes. We saw that although the priests saw nothing, it was witnessed by, a, by about 100 people in the procession, they could look directly at the sun, which was blinking. We saw that the outer rim of the sun was spinning at a high speed. We saw that at first the rim was red, then it turned golden, and finally it turned blue. We briefly considered some of the symbolism of this miracle. Once again, in the dimming of the sun's brightness, we can see a symbolic warning of judgment on corrupt church leaders who have departed from justice and holiness to depravity and wickedness. And we can see a symbolic warning of judgment on the Catholic people as a whole who haven't kept the commandments. We saw that the fact this miracle was not visible to the priest was symbolic of priests in the world today 
who are losing their faith and not praying, not praying their rosary, not even praying their breviaries. A priest that are blinded and choking in the smoke of the operation of error. We saw that the symbolism of the procession following Our Lady pointed to the fact that we each must faithfully follow Our Lady, stay very close to her, just like the children of the Apostle John, and she'll conquer. We saw the red symbolized martyrdom, the color gold symbolized the presence of God and heavenly royalty, and the color blue symbolizes Our Lady. We saw that the color red as a symbol of martyrdom was obviously related to the symbolism of the location, since the rem is the precise place where the three little children were put to the test to the point where they actually believed that the others had been martyred by being boiled alive in oil. And yet, in spite of that, each one of them remained faithful. We saw the message here was that there are terrible trials ahead, but even should we be threatened with martyrdom, we must remain firm, firm in the faith by remaining close to and obedient to Our Lady, obedient even unto death, that we must be prepared, fully prepared, to die for the truth. We can see that the blinking of the sun, the flashing on and off, is reminiscent of the blinking lights that are used for emergencies. We saw the date of the miracle, March 4th, is the day on which the Fatima Novena begins. The symbolism there is obvious. The days are numbered. We saw it was the 99th year, and again, that symbolism was obvious. The time is short. The time is running out. It's a symbolic message that all in all points to a very urgent situation. We saw we're living in a time when there are so many false prophets and end-time prophecies that's created a sort of immunity towards actually obeying our Lord's explicit command to read the signs of the times. It's created a sort of immunity to ever believing that this is something to actually concern ourselves with. We saw the terrifying result of all this is that when the real danger and the real prophet arrives, Our Lady for, uh, Fatima, for example, people laugh and scorn and mock her and pay her no need, heed. They tell themselves it's all just a private revelation. They don't have to believe it. They can't even bother to trouble themselves to consider the meaning of a miracle, which is not a revelation at all. It's a historical event. It's absolutely positively not a revelation. This miracle, a miracle of literally biblical proportions, is an absolutely unique and unparalleled historical event. It's not a private revelation. It's a truly apocalyptic historical event. And we see that because people have been conditioned by the lies of false prophets, by the laxity of the priests, by the atmosphere of society, think there's no danger of the second coming, it's easy to understand why when those terrible things predicted for the end finally do arrive, whenever that is, so many people will be caught off guard. We saw that Sister Lucia said we are in the last times of the world for three reasons. First, because Our Lady told her the devil's engaging in a final battle with the Virgin. Second, because Our Lady told her and her cousins that God has given two final remedies to the world, the Holy Rosary and devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And third, because when God is going to chastise the world, He always first exhausts all of the remedies. When He sees that the world pays no attention whatsoever, then He presents us the last means of salvation, His Blessed Mother, which is obviously what He's done at Fatima and Tre Fontane. We saw that Sister Lucia warned if we despise and reject this last means, the Blessed Mother, heaven will no longer pardon us. We saw that Sister Lucia stated their mission was not just to tell about the material punishments that will certainly come over the earth if the world does not pray and do penance, but their mission is to warn every, everyone of the eminent danger we are in of losing our souls for all eternity if we remain fixed in sin. We saw that Sister Lucia also warned us we should not wait for a call to the world from Rome on the part of the Holy Father to do penance, nor should we wait for a call to, for penance to come from the bishops in our diocese, nor from our religious congregations. We saw she point out the reason we shouldn't wait for these warnings, because since our Lord has often used these means, and the world has not paid heed. And we, and we saw that she said that now each one of us must begin to reform himself spiritually, that each one is called to save not only his own soul, but also all the souls that God has placed in his pathway. So much for our review. We'll get started. Today we're going to turn to the third secret. For much of the analysis at this point, we'll rely heavily on the book, The Fourth Secret, written by Antonio Sochi. He's a friend of Pope Benedict XVI, an acclaimed Italian journalist and television personality. Sochi comments on the circumstances of the release of The Third Secret. Quote, after long and dramatic deliberation, the Pope personally decided to publish the text in 2000. It was announced in the most solemn manner, from the sanctuary of Fatima, before the Pope and the visionary, by the Vatican Secretary of State. And it was even published on June 26, 2000, with the accompaniment of a theological commentary by the highest doctrinal authority of the Church next to the Pope, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, Prefect of the Formal Holy Office. 
presented the text of the secret in his commentary at nothing less than a press conference televised worldwide. We'll read the text. Sister Lucia, quote, JMJ, the third part of the secret revealed at the COVID area of Fatima on 13 July 1917. I write in obedience to my God, who command me to do so through His Excellency, the Bishop of Liera, and to your Most Holy Mother and mine. After the two parts, which I've already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance! Penance! Penance. And we saw in an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city half in ruins and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bolts, bullets and arrows at him. In the same way there died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross there were two angels each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. Tui, January 3rd, 1944, close quote. It's a very, very symbolic vision. What does it mean? For very good reasons, many people have got the impression this vi vision refers simply to Aliaga's 1981 assassination attempt against the Pope. Sochi explains why. On May 13, 2000, Cardinal Sedano, that's the Secretary of State at the time, announces that the famous Third Secret of Fatima will soon be published. At the same time, anticipates the theological interpretation of that extremely delicate text by linking the vision of the assassination attempt. One Vaticanist comments, what happened on May 13, 2000 represents something unique in the history of the church. A correct interpretation was offered even before the text to be interpreted was provided. Close quote. So the reason that so many people have gotten the impression that the vision refers simply to Ali August 1981 assassination attempt against the Pope is because Cardinal Sedano said so even before the text itself had been released. Most Catholics don't realize that Paul VI praised the Secretary of State over the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. After the announcement the preemptive explanation of this vision by his superior, Cardinal Sedano, Cardinal Ratzinger was then asked by Cardinal Sedano to write a commentary on that preemptive explanation, and that commentary was then released at the same time as the text of the vision. Sochi explains, quote, on June 26th, Cardinal Ratzinger was not able to make a free theological comment on the text, but insistently declared that interpretation was by the Secretary of State, and he was only giving points of reflection within the confines of a predetermined interpretative framework, stating explicitly the limits of his commentary. Cardinal Ratzinger. And what follows, therefore, we can only attempt to provide a deeper foundation for this interpretation, interpretation of Cardinal Sedano, close quote. In other words, even before it had been released, Cardinal Sedano had already announced his interpretation of the Third Secret, and then he had Cardinal Ratzinger comment on that interpretation. Cardinal Ratzinger did so, but he made it clear that all he was doing was commenting further on the interpretation proposed by his superior. Sochi continues, noting that not only did Cardinal Ratzinger downplay the significance of this interpretation, he also stressed that converting the, concerning the Fatima visions, there are no official definitions nor obligatory interpretations. And I'm quoting and that there are other attempts at interpretation which can be well-founded. The Cardinal also stressed in response to an inquiry from a bishop that he did not at all wish, quote, to attribute exclusively to the past the contents of the secret in a simplistic manner, close quote. So in other words, even as he was commenting on Cardinal Sedano's explanation that the vision pertained to the assassination attempt on St. John Paul II, Cardinal Ratzinger made the specific points that concerning the Fatima visions, there are no official definitions nor obligatory interpretations, and there are other attempts at interpretation which can be well founded. So although the Holy See did give one possible explanation of this vision, that explanation is not official or obligatory, and we're perfectly free to seek other well founded possibilities, and that's exactly what we'll do. Sochi asks, what is the sense of this vision that is so enigmatic and of these prefigured events? 
the martyrdom of the Pope, and with him many pastors and Catholics in the context of a frightening devastation. How can they be explained? Is it possible that the Madonna would appear so sensationally at Fatima to give a message warning of such importance that nevertheless remains incomprehensible? Is it possible that the vision published by the Vatican in 2000 was not explained by the Holy Virgin? Close quote. Is it possible that the Madonna would appear so sensationally at Fatima to give a warning of such importance that it nevertheless remains incomprehensible? Is it possible that that vision was not explained by Our Lady? We'll answer those que that question or those questions by asking a related question. Is it possible that Our Lady would show a perfectly comprehensible vision of hell to the children and then explain exactly what that vision meant and then show them another vision, a mysterious vision, but then give them no ex explanation, no clear explanation of what that meant? Is that possible? No, it's not possible. It's not possible Our Lady would show the children a perfectly comprehensible vision of hell and then explain exactly what it meant, and then show them another vision, a mysterious vision, and give them no clear explanation as to what the vision meant. That's just not possible. Remember, Lucia is the only one of the three children who spoke to Our Lady during the apparitions. St. Jacinta could both see and hear Our Lady, but never spoke to her during the apparitions. And St. Francisco could see the Blessed Virgin, but he could not hear her words. He couldn't even understand the words of the angel of Portugal. He never once heard the words. So St. Francisco could not hear words. That's why Our Lady told the girls, do not tell this to anybody. Francisco, yes, you may tell him. Now think about that. Lucia and St. Jacinta could both see and hear Our Lady. St. Francisco could see the Blessed Virgin perfectly, but he couldn't hear. And this is why the lady told the girls, do not tell this to anybody. Francisco, you may tell him. Think about it. The text we've just read, the release text, describes a vision. The release text is a description of the vision the three children saw, all three of them. But there are no words from Our Lady. Our Lady told the girls they were not supposed to tell this to anybody, but they could tell it to Francisco. So what were the girls supposed to tell Francisco? What could they tell him? He saw everything they saw. So we're missing something. We're missing the very words of Our Lady which explain the symbolic vision. That's perfectly consistent with the testimony of Sister Lucia. On January 3rd, 1944, after she had been told to write the third secret had been struggling mightily to obey, but try as she might, she just couldn't get it committed to paper, Our Lady appeared to her and told her, and I quote, Be at peace and write what they order you, but not what has been given you to understand its meaning, close quote. And at that point, Sister Lucy was instantly able to commit the vision to paper. Our Lady told Sister Lucia to be at peace Write what they order to tell you, but not what has been given you to understand its meaning. So the text we read earlier, the text released by the Vatican in the year 2000, is a description of the vision that three children saw, but it doesn't contain the explanation. We're missing the very words of Our Lady, which explain the symbolic vision. Consider this excerpt from an interview Sister Lucia gave to Father Jongen in 1946. As we read this, please think about exactly what is being said. Quote, when Father Jongen interviewed her in 1946, Sister Lucia answered firmly, When I speak about the apparitions, I limit myself to giving the meaning of the words I heard. On the other hand, when I write, I take pains to cite the words literally. Thus, I intended to write down the secret word for word. Are you certain of having kept it in your memory? I believe so. Then the words of the secret were quoted in the order they were communicated to? Yes. We'll go back through that again and make a few comments. Sister Lucia, when I speak about the apparitions, I limit myself to giving the meaning of the words I heard. On the other hand, when I write, I take pains, pains to cite the words literally. Thus, I intended to write down the secret, word for word. Father Jongen, then the words of the secret were quoted in the order they communicated to? Yes. Okay, so when Sister Lucia wrote about the apparitions, she took pain to cite the words literally, and she intended to write down the secret word for word. And when she did so, she wrote the words of the secret in, or, in the order they were communicated to her. She wrote the literal words of the secret down, word for word, in the order they were communicated to her. What words? When questioned about the July apparition in the canonical investigation in 1924, Lucia testified, Then the lady told us some brief words, commanding us not to tell them to anyone, except Francisco alone. What words? 
On October 17th and 18th, 1946, Canon Bartos interviewed Sister Lucia regarding the third secret and reported that, quote, the text of the words of Our Lady written by Sister Lucia are enclosed in a sealed envelope, close quote. What words? The text we read, the release text of the third secret, describes a vision. The release text is a description of the vision the three children saw, all three of them. There are no words from Our Lady. There are no words from Our Lady, so we're missing something. We're missing the very words of Our Lady which explain the symbolic vision. Antonio Sochi. If the attack of 1981 is really the complete fulfillment of the secret, and if it is something that's by now been consigned to the past, already realized, our attention is drawn to an interesting, mysterious phrase that John Paul II uttered to Vito Missouri in the book interview, Crossing the Threshold of Hope. That book was published in 1994, and hence was written many years after the attack of 1981. The Pope was, in fact, recalling the attack, John Paul II. Therefore, when I was shot by the assassin in St. Peter's Square, I did not pay any heed at first to the fact it was precisely the anniversary of the day in which Mary had appeared to the three shepherds in Fatima in Portugal, revealing to them those words, which by the end of the century seem to be moving towards their fulfillment. It is amazing that these words of the Pope have passed without observation. We find them in, at least two, in them at least two important revelations. The first is that 13 years after the attack, that is, at the end of the century, John Paul II held that the Fatima prophecy had yet to be realized completely. The second revelation is that as the Pope informs us, the prophecy whose fulfillment is approaching was expressed by Mary with words. Close quote. So the Pope himself indicated the secret had not been fulfilled in the assassination attempt. And even more significantly, he stated that when I was shot by the assassin in St. Peter's Square, I did not pay any heed at first to the fact it was precisely the anniversary of the day on which Mary had appeared to the three shepherds in Fatima in Portugal, revealing to them those words, which by the end of the century seemed to be moving towards their fulfillment. What words? What we've seen is a vision. The release text is a vision, but there are no words of Our Lady. Antonio Sochi approaches this problem from a different angle. Studying the introduction of the third secret found on the Vatican website, and you can do this yourself, I did it the other day, he noticed something very strange. As we read this, pay careful attention to the dates. Sochi, quote, Cardinal Bertoni informs us that John Paul II requested the envelope containing the third part of the secret after the attack on May 13, 1981, reading it precisely on July 18, 1981. And he, John Paul II, thought immediately of consecrating the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which was realized the first time with the act of entrustment performed in the Basilica of St. Mary Major on June 7, 1981. As one observer notes, how is it possible that the reading of the third secret prompt the Pope to consecrate the world to Mary on June 7, 1981, when according to the affirmation of Carlo Butoni, the Pope would have read the secret no earlier than July 18th, more than six weeks later? Sochi asks, how can this be explained? It is unimaginable that it involves an oversight, and it is equally unimaginable that Monsignor Bertoni would furnish false information, close quote. Using evidence, including direct testimony from the personal secretary of Pope St. John XXIII, Sochi demonstrates, in fact, that there are two envelopes from Sister Lucia containing two documents pertaining to the third secret. We're not going to go into those details. The obvious conclusion is that one of the envelopes contained the release text of the, of the third secret, the description of the vision the three children saw, and the other envelope contains the words of Our Lady explaining the meaning of this vision. Now, in an earlier conference, we saw that Our Lady intended the veiled meaning of her symbolic messages to be understood by anyone that's seeking the truths found in them. But for the most part, the hearts of the people were not or are not open to her message. There's an exact analogy between how our Lord uses parables and how our Lady uses these symbolic messages. Although the three children were given the explanations of what these things meant, for the outside, everything's in symbols, so that they may indeed see but not perceive and hear but not understand. The great majority of men never have been interested in those truths, and so they were left hardened and unresponsive. The very thought, fact that Our Lady taught in the symbolic message was already a prophetic sign of upcoming judgment. In other words, the very format of the third secret, as it's been revealed to us, a symbolic vision without the accompanying explanation, that format is in itself already a sign of judgment. It's a sign of the state of men's hearts. And that's worth pondering. So using evidence, including direct testimony 
from the Percival Secretary of Pope St. John XXIII, Sochi demonstrates there are two envelopes containing two documents pertaining to Third Secret. The obvious conclusion is that one of the envelopes contains the release text of the Third Secret, the description of the vision the three children saw, and the other envelope contains the words of Our Lady explaining the meaning of this vision, and this explains an otherwise very puzzling discrepancy. On the Vatican website, there are photographic reproductions of Sister Lucia's original handwritten document describing the vision of the Third Secret. That handwritten document takes up four sheets of paper and is about 64 lines long. But we know from previous testimony that in March 1957, on orders from Rome, the Third Secret, which had been enclosed in an envelope by Sister Lucia, which was then sealed in another envelope by the Bishop of Vieira Fatima, was taken from Portugal and delivered to the Vatican. Before the secret was taken, the auxiliary bishop, Venancio, held up the bishop's envelope to the light. He could see Sister Lucia's inner envelope containing an ordinary sheet of paper with three-quarter centimeter margins on which were written approximately 25 lines. He took the exact measurement of the in inner envelope, 12 centimeters by 18 centimeters, and recorded this in a document stored in the Fatima archives. Carlo Anaviani, the head of the Holy Office, which then became the Congregation of the Faith after the Council, Cardinal Ottaviani, who read the third secret, later stated the secret was 25 lines long, written on a single sheet of paper. The obvious conclusion is that one of the envelopes contains the text, released in 2000, and it can be viewed on the Vatican website. That takes, four sheet, takes up four sheets of paper and is 64 lines long. And the other envelope contained the words of our lady explaining the meaning of this vision, written on a single sheet of paper. That's 25 lines long. Now, more importantly, Sochi argues persuasively, in fact, that Rome has indeed revealed, in an implicit manner, the essential contents of the second envelope, the envelope containing the words of Our Lady, which enables them to say in conscience that all the third secret has been revealed. And this would be a very Roman way of doing things. So you have to pay very careful attention sometimes when they say things because words really matter. They said revealed, not published. We'll take a very quick look at that right now, and we'll consider just what the probable contents of that second envelope might be. There are two envelopes again. One has the description, the vision that we read, and the other contains the words. And Sochi argues that, in fact, Rome has implicitly revealed the, one, the, the content of the second envelope, and for that reason they can say it's been revealed. Antonio Sochi explains. My hypothesis, which is also based on private disclosures, is this. In the Curia, opposition to publication of the Third Secret had always been prevalent, above all because of the part concerning this, the Church or because the prophetic words of the Madonna, which according to the dominant opinion of the Vatican, would be used against the Vatican, would create great alarm among the people if made available to public opinion and the media. It was decided that on May 13, 2000, at the end of the Mass for the beatification of the two shepherds of Fatima, publication of the text of the vision with an interpretation that would link it to events in the past would be announced. And then the essential contents of the message of the Madonna would also be published implicitly, but not explicitly, in the homily that John Paul II gave during that Mass. Close quote. Okay, so the Curia, that's the Pope's uh, court or his cabinet. The Curia was opposed to publishing the Third Secret. They were afraid the contents could be used against the Vatican, would create great alarm among the people if it was made available to public opinion in the media. So that's already worth meditating on. So they decided to implicitly reveal the words of Our Lady in the homily given by St. John Paul during the Mass for the beatifications of St. Jacinta and Francisco, and then after the Mass to announce the text of the vision would be released. Sergi continues, this would permit them to say in conscience that all the third secret had been revealed, but in such a way as to avoid, in their opinion, a great shock to the Christian people, sensationalistic broadcasts, and a reaction of panic. This decision probably would also have been made on the strength of authoritative precedent, which in the church is always important. Because it can be held that Paul VI, while deciding not to publish the third secret, wished in his surprising homily during the pilgrimage to Fatima in 1967, a pilgrimage made for the quite significant intention of peace in the church and preservation of the faith, Paul VI wished to reveal implicitly to the Christian people the essential secret message of the Virgin. Close quote. Okay. So according to Sochi, there's two basic reasons the third secret is revealed this way, explicitly in the case of the vision, implicitly in the, in, in the case of Our Lady's words. In the first place, if the Holy See could say all the third secret have been revealed, there's no more to reveal. In the second place, to reveal this in such a way as to avoid shock on the part of the Christian people, or in a reaction of panic. He points out that during his pilgrimage to Fatima in 67, Paul VI had also implicitly revealed the essential elements of the third secret. 
We'll consider the words of the pulps in a few minutes. So we have the vision, but what does it mean? In an effort to come to some potential conclusions about the meaning of the third secret, about the meaning of this mysterious vision, we'll start with a comment from Sister Lucia. Quote, the third part of the secret refers to Our Lady's words. If not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. The third part of the secret is a symbolic revelation, referring to this part of the message, conditioned by whether we accept or not what the message itself asks of us. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, etc. Since we did not heed this appeal of the message, we see that it has been fulfilled. Russia has invaded the world with her errors. And if we have not yet seen the complete fulfillment of the final part of this prophecy, we are going towards it little by little with great strides. If we do not reject the path of sin, hatred, revenge, injustice, violations of the rights of the human person, immorality and violence, etc. And let us not say that it is God who has punished us in this way. On the contrary, it is men themselves who are preparing their own punishment. In his kindness, God warns us and calls us to the right path, or respecting the freedom he has given us. Hence, men are responsible. Close quote, Sister Lucia, May 12, 1982. Okay, so it's a symbolic, the third part of the secret is a symbolic revelation referring to Our Lady's words. If not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. And it's conditioned by whether or not we accept what the message has asked us. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted, there will be peace. If not, she'll spread her errors throughout the world, etc. Since we did not heed this appeal of the message, we see it's been fulfilled. Russia has invaded the world with her errors, and if we have not yet seen the complete fulfillment of the final part of this prophecy, we're going towards it little by little with great strides. It's not God who is punishing us in this way, rather it's people themselves who are praying their own punishment. Now with that as background, let's break up the vision into sections and on that basis organize statements from various reliable sources to try to get some idea of the probable meaning. Sister Lucia, quote, After the two parts which I have already explained, the left of Our Lady and little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated, to radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance, penance, penance. Close quote. So scripturally speaking, the angel with the flaming sword instantly calls to mind a series of images of sin as punishment. Our first parents being driven out of the Garden of Eden because of sin. The cherubim with a flaming sword guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden, closed because of the fall of man. The corresponding closing of heaven, the loss of sanctifying grace, and the alliance with the devil in the garden. It also brings to mind various images of divine judgment. In Psalm 7, verse 12, we read, Unless you convert, God will brandish his sword. The notion of the inescapability of God's judgment is also placed before us. There's literally nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. When we read in Jeremiah 12, 12, that, quote, The sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other. Of course, it calls to mind judgment day, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 7. The heavens and the earth that now exist have been stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The angels cry, penance, 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 also calls to mind sin, the sins of mankind, and the fact that this heavenly warning is repeated three times indicates that the situation is very grave. Cardinal Ratzinger's comments on this scene are well worth contemplating. I quote, To save souls has emerged as the key word of the first and second parts of the secret. And the key word of this third part is the threefold cry, penance, penance, penance. The beginning of the gospel comes to mind. Repent and believe the good news. To understand the signs of the times means to accept the urgency of penance, of conversion, of faith. This is the correct response to this moment of history, characterized by the grave perils outlined in the images that follow. The angel with a flaming sword on the left of the mother God recalls similar images in the book of Revelation. This represents the threat of judgment which looms over the world. Today the prospect that the world might be reduced to ashes by a sea of fire no longer seems pure fantasy. Man himself, with his inventions, has forged the flaming sword. 
The vision then shows the power which stands opposed to the force of destruction, the splendor of the mother of God, and the summons to penance. In this way, the importance of human freedom is underlined. Close quote. And this echoes the words of Sister Lucia. Quote, in his kindness, God warns us and calls us to the right path while respecting the freedom he has given us. If we do not reject the path of sin, hatred, revenge, injustice, violation of the rights of the human person, immorality and violence, etc., it is men themselves who are preparing their own punishment. Hence, men are responsible. Close quote. So the symbolism in the first passage of the vision of the third secret calls to mind sin, grave sin, men being driven out from the presence of God, calls to mind the book of Revelation, the prospect that the world might be reduced to ashes by a sea of fire, the threat of divine judgment looming over the world and even of judgment day itself, it reminds us of the urgency of penance, of conversion, of faith, and it is men ourselves who are preparing their own punishment, that mankind is responsible. Now hold those thoughts and we'll consider what Popes Paul VI, St. John Paul II, and Benedict XVI said during their visits to Fatima. Remember what we're trying to do here is draw probable conclusions as to the meaning of this mysterious vision. And since we haven't been given the words, we'll start by considering the comments of the Popes, then those who, others who have read the secret, and then we'll add other comments from arrival sources. So remember that Sochi argues because the courier was afraid they were, uh, to simply punish, or they opposed, I shouldn't say afraid. Sochi argues because the courier was opposed to simply punishing the third, publishing the third secret because they were afraid the contents would be used against the Vatican, would create, create great alarm among the people. It was decided in conversations with the Pope to implicitly real, reveal the words of Our Lady in the homily that St. John Paul II gave during the Mass of the Beatification of Saints Francisco and Jacinta. Then after the Mass, to announce the text of the vision. So according to Sochi, there are two basic reasons the third secret was revealed in this way. Explicitly in the case of the vision, implicitly in the case of Our Lady's words. So in the first place, the Holy See could actually say they'd revealed everything, and they could do that honestly. In the second place, to stop any kind of sensationalism or alarm around the Christian people. Sochi argued during his pilgrimage to Fatima in 67, Pope Paul VI implicitly revealed the third secret also. So we'll start with Paul VI. The first notable point is that in his visit, visit to Fatima, Paul VI invokes the image found in chapter 13, 12 of the book of the Apocalypse. The great sign which the Apostle John saw in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, is interpreted by the sacred liturgy as referring to the most blessed Mary, the mother of all men, by the grace of Christ her Redeemer. Close quote, the Holy Father. We continue. Quote, we wish to pray for the interior peace of the church. The ecumenical council has re reawakened many energies in the bosom of the church. What an evil it would be if an arbitrary interpretation, not authorized by the magisterium of the church, were to transform the spiritual renewal of the Second Vatican Council into a restlessness which dissolves the church's traditional structure and constitution. Substituting the theology of true teachings with new ideologies which depart from the norm of faith. Finally transforming redemptive charity into an acquiescence in the negative forms of the profane mentality of worldly customs. What disenchantment then would be caused? Close quote, Paul VI. So Paul VI warns that in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, the internal peace of the church is at risk. He speaks of how evil it would be and what disillusionment it would cause if what was intended to be a spiritual renewal of the church were derailed. In that regard, he speaks of what would now be called the spirit of Vatican II, or to use Benedict uh, the 16th much more academic term, the hermeneutic of discontinuity, as he speaks of the traditional structure and constitution of the church being dissolved by an unauthorized interpretations, as he speaks of the substitute of true teachings with new teachings, ideologies which are not of the faith, and as he speaks of a transformation to a profane mentality and worldly customs, all of which has been going on throughout the church all these many years. The Pope continues speaking of, quote, those countries in which religious liberty is practically suppressed where the denial of God is promoted. We declare, the world is in danger. Therefore, we have come by foot to the feet of the Queen of Peace to ask for the gift that only God can give, peace. Men think of the gravity and the greatness of this hour, which could be decisive for the history of the present and future generation. The picture of the world and of its destiny presented here is immense and dramatic. It is the scene that the Madonna opens before us, the scene that we contemplate with horrified eyes. Close quote, Pope Paul VI. Now, in 1967, those countries where religious liberty was practically suppressed, where the denial of God was promoted, were, for the most part, 
behind the Iron Curtain. At that time, these were the countries dominated by the heirs of Russia. He warns that the world's in danger and asks Soleil for peace, speaking of the scene that Our Lady of Fatima opens before him, a scene that he contemplates with horrified eyes. Paula VI, devoutly contemplating Mary, the faithful draw from her a stimulus for trusting prayer, a spur to the practice of penance and to the holy fear of God. Likewise, it is in this, that they more often hear echoing the words with which Jesus Christ announced the advent of the kingdom of heaven, repent and believe in the gospel, and his severe admonition, unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. Close quote. Okay, so in his visit to Fatima, Paul VI invokes the image found in chapter 12 of the book of the Apocalypse of the woman clothed by the sun. He warns that in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, the internal peace of the church is at risk. He speaks of how evil it would be and what disillusionment it would cause if what was intended to be a spiritual renewal of the church were derailed. He refers to what we would commonly call the spirit of Vatican II, while speaking of unauthorized interpretations that dissolve the traditional structure and constitution of the church. He speaks of true teachings being substituted by new teachings which are not of the faith. He speaks of a final transformation to a profane mentality and worldly customs. He warns that the world is in danger, and he asks Our Lady for peace, speaking of a scene that Our Lady shows him, the scene he contemplates with horrified eyes. He also warns mankind to repent and believe in the gospel, and unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. Now let's turn to the homily preached in Fatima by St. John Paul II, just before the announcement that the text of the third secret would be released. St. John Paul II. According to the divine plan, a woman clothed with the sun came down from heaven to this earth to visit, visit the privileged children of the Father. She speaks to them with a mother's voice and heart. She asks them to offer themselves as victims of reparation, saying that she was ready to leave them safely to God. Behold, they see a light shining from maternal hands which penetrates them inwardly. So they feel immersed in God, just as they explain, a person sees himself in a mirror. Later, Francisca, one of the three privileged children, exclaimed, We are burning in that light which is God, and we are not consumed. What is God like? It is impossible to say. In fact, we will never be able to tell people. God, a light that burns without consuming. Moses had the same experience when he saw God in the burning bush. Close quote. So St. John Paul II starts with the same image as Paul VI, the woman clothed by the sun, and then he continues with several more lines from the same chapter in the Apocalypse. St. John Paul II, quote, Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. These words make us think of the great struggle between good and evil, showing how, when man puts God aside, he cannot achieve happiness, but ends up destroying himself. How many victims there have been through the last century of the second millennium? We remember the horrors of the First and Second World Wars and other wars in so many parts of the world, the concentration and extermination camps, the gulags, ethnic cleansings and persecutions, terrorism, kidnappings, drugs, the attacks on unborn life and the family. The message of Fatima is a call to conversion, alerting humanity to have nothing to do with the dragon whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. Close quote, St. John Paul II. So the Pope has just cited Apocalypse 12, verses 3 and 4. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. What do the scriptural commentaries say about these two lines of the Apocalypse? Quote, Red is the color of anger and blood, especially the blood of martyrs. But it may have another signification. No fiercer enemy of God and man has appeared in Christian times in communism, and red is its emblematic color, close quote. Quote, the dragon is seen in heaven, which here is the symbol of the church. This indicates the first troubles of those days will be inaugurated within the church by apostate bishops, priests, and peoples. The stars dragged down by the tail of the dragon. The tail of the dragon represents the cunning hypocrisy with which he succeeds in deceiving a large number of people and pastors, a third part of the stars. Close quote. And quote, those whom he had swept onto earth with his tail, he seduced by love of earthly things. Close quote. Quote, the tale is a symbol of lying and hypocrisy. Through false doctrines and principles, Satan will mislead the clergy who will have become worldly-minded, haughty, and hypocritical. By their lax principles, they will infect the laity, who will easily welcome a mitigation or change of doctrine to sanction the lukewarm lives they want to lead. Close quote. So among other things, these lines are warning not to be seduced by the love of earthly things, a warning of martyrdom and communism, 
A warning, Satan is inside the church in the person of his apostate bishops, priests, and people. A warning against lying, hypocritical, worldly mind clergy. A warning against false teachings and changes in doctrine. The Pope is warning us to be careful, to be very, very careful, to not have anything to do with any of this. And in the context of demonstrating that when man puts God aside, he cannot achieve happiness, but ends up destroying himself, St. John Paul II mentions an entire litany of horrors of the last century, the First and Second World Wars, the other wars throughout the world, the concentration and extermination camps, the gulags, ethnic cleansings, persecutions, terrorism, kidnappings, drugs, attacks on unborn life in the family. And he sums up the message of Fatima as being a call to conversion, wanting to have nothing to do with the great red dragon who appeared in heaven and whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. That message, directly from the apocalypse, is not anywhere to be found in the published parts of the message of Fatima. Presumably, then, it comes from the words of Our Lady. Antonio Sochi comments, It seems evident that the Pope, with these citations of the Apocalypse, has given the world a glimpse into the contents of the Third Secret. Because by following the footsteps of Paul VI, but with a more accentuated revelation of the secret, it is reasonable to suppose that this was the compromise on the basis of which the Vatican can today maintain that it has revealed all the secret of Fatima. And he points out that every time St. John Paul II visited Fatima, his words reflected these same themes. Consider, for example, these excerpts from his sermon preached in Fatima on May 13, 1982. St. John Paul II. Let us seek to understand the extraordinary message of Fatima. Repent and believe in the gospel. The message of Fatima is in its basic nucleus a call to conversion and repentance. Can the mother, with all the force of love she fosters in the Holy Spirit, desires everyone's salvation, keep silence on what undermines the very basis of their salvation? No, she cannot. The message is addressed to every human being, to all the societies, nations, and peoples, societies menaced by apostasy, threatened by moral degradation. The collapse of morality involves the collapse of societies. The message of Fatima is so deeply rooted in the gospel and the whole of tradition that the church feels the message imposes a commitment upon her. The successor of Peter presents himself here as a witness to the almost apocalyptic menaces looking over the nations and mankind as a whole. The whole range of menaces gathering like a dark cloud over mankind. Close quote, St. John Paul II. So we see the call to conversion, the call to repent and believe in the gospel. That's the exact line said by Paul VI on his visit. And it calls to mind the cries of the angel with the flaming sword. But consider this line. The message of Fatima is so deeply rooted in the gospel and the whole of tradition that the church feels that the message imposes a commitment on her. That's an extraordinary statement. Out of the words of Our Lady that have been published, what exactly is so deeply rooted in the gospel and the whole of tradition that the message imposes a commitment on the church? The Pope says that the menace, message is addressed to every human being, to all the societies, nations, and peoples. Societies menaced by apostasy, threatened by moral degradation. The collapse of morality involves the collapse of societies. And he presents himself in Fatim as a witness to the almost apocalyptic menace looking over the nations and mankind at whole the whole range of menaces gathering like a dark cloud over mankind. And most significantly, he asks, can a mother who with all the force of love she fosters in the Holy Spirit desires everyone's salvation keep silence on what undermines the very basis of their salvation? No, they cannot. That's very significant. He points out Our Lady cannot keep silent on what undermines the basis of our salvation. In other words, since Our Lady cannot remain silent on what undermines the basis of our salvation, she must have said something in this regard. What is the basis of our salvation? It's our Catholic faith. As St. Paul says in Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The very basis of our salvation is our Catholic faith, and the Pope speaks of this being undermined. What does it mean to undermine something? The dictionary tells us to undermine something means, quote, to injure or destroy by insidious activity or imperceptible stages, to attack by indirect, secret, or underhand means, attempt to subvert by stealth, close quote. And that's exactly what was said about the tail of the dragon, that it represents the cunning hypocrisy by which he deceives the large number of people and pastors, how he succeeds in undermining their faith with false doctrines and principles, and that the stars dragged down by the tail of the dragon are the apostate bishops, priests, and peoples. Furthermore, in this very sermon, this pope explicitly mentions apostasy. Apostasy, of course, is the sin by which a baptized person completely and totally rejects and repudiates the faith. Heresy, on the other hand, 
is the sin by which a baptized person a voluntary and obstinately denies one or more of the truths which have been revealed by God and proposed by the church for our belief. So a heretic denies some of it, the apostate gets rid of all of it. It's clear that the message of Fatima contains a warning from Our Lady regarding dangers to our faith. Now we'll quickly consider some of the comments of Pope Benedict XVI made during his pilgrimage to Fatima in May of 2010. Benedict XVI, we would be mistaken to think that Fatima's prophetic mission is complete. Hither takes on new life, the plan of God which asks humanity from the beginning. Where's your brother, brother Abel? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Mankind has succeeded in unleashing a cycle of death and terror, but failed in bringing it to an end. Close quote. So he speaks of one of the sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance, willful murder, when he speaks of Abel's blood crying out to God, and then he says, mankind has succeeded in unleashing a cycle of terror death, but failed in bringing it to an end. During his flight to Fatima, he made another statement that's very well worth pondering. Interviewer, Your Holiness, what meaning do the Fatima apparitions have for us today? Is it possible to your mind to include in that vision the sufferings of the church today for the sins involved in the sexual abuse of minors? Benedict XVI. Beyond this great vision of the suffering of the Pope, an indication is given of realities involving the future of the church, which are gradually taking shape and becoming evident. There is mention of, there is seen the need for a passion of the church, which naturally is reflected in the person of the Pope. Yet the Pope stands for the church, and thus it is sufferings of the church that are announced. The Lord told us that the church would constantly be suffering in different ways until the end of the world. Close quote. So the Pope speaks of the passion of the church as being symbolized by the suffering Pope in this vision. We'll return to this point later. Benedict XVI, the message of Fatima, the fundamental response, is to ongoing conversion, penance, prayer, and the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Those are consistent themes that the popes use whenever they speak of the message of Fatima. Benedict XVI, as for the new things which we can find in this message today, there's also the fact that attacks on the Pope and the Church come not only from without, but the sufferings of the Church come precisely from within the Church, from the sin existing within the Church. This too is something we've always known, but today we are seeing it in a really terrifying way. That the greatest persecution of the Church comes not from her enemies without, but arises from sin within the Church. The Church thus has a deep need to relearn penance, to accept purification, to learn forgiveness on the one hand, but also the need for justice. Forgiveness does not replace justice. In a word, we need to really re relearn precisely this essential, conversion, prayer, penance, and the theological virtues. Close quote. So the sufferings of the church come precisely from within the church, from the sin existing within the church. Today we're seeing in a really terrifying way the greatest persecution of the church comes not from her enemies without, but from sin within. St. John Paul too warned us to have nothing to do with the great red dragon of the apocalypse, who appeared in heaven, and whose tail swept down a third of the stars of the heaven and cast them to the earth. Benedict XVI seems to be reiterating exactly what the scriptural commentary spoke of when treating of that dragon. The dragon is seen in heaven, which in this verse is a symbol of the church. The first trouble of those days will be inaugurated within the church by apostate bishops, priests, and peoples. The stars dragged down by the tail of the dragon. The tail of the dragon represents the cunning hypocrisy with which he succeeds in deceiving a large number of people and pastors, a third part of the stars. The tail is a symbol of lying hypocrisy. Through false doctrines and principles, Satan will mislead the clergy, who will become worldly-minded, haughty, and hypocritical. By their lax principles, they will infect the laity, who will easily welcome mitigation or change of doctrine to sanction the lukewarm lives they want to lead. And when in the context of a question on the sexual abuse of minors, a question as to whether the vision of the third secret includes the suffering of the church for those horrific sins, Pope Benedict states the church has a deep need to relearn penance, to accept purification, and the need for justice. What is he saying when he says that? Well, let's put that in a different way. What sort of penance is a hierarchy of the church done? Public penance and reparation for all this sexual abuse. What have they imposed on themselves? In this country, the Dallas Accords for dealing with horrific crimes deal with, apply to all members of the clergy, except for the bishops. 
So what kind of penance has the hierarchy of the church done in reparation for this horrific scandal? None. They can't even get themselves to admit it's a homosexual problem. Yet anyone can simply look at their own reports. On the USCCB website, and I went there yesterday, it states 81% of the victims were male, in spite of the fact that in this country, studies, quote, and this is from their website, have consistently shown that in general, girls are three times more likely to be abused than boys, close quote. Okay, so Pope Benedict spoke about the need for justice and purification. What would a purification like that look like? Keep in mind that this is another one of the sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance. What would divine justice look like in the case of the sodomitical abuse of so many altar boys? You know what it'd look like. We all know what it would look like. Fire from heaven, that's what it would look like. Okay, let's remind ourselves of what we're doing right now. We've been considering the first part of the vision. At the left of a lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. They died out in contact with the splendor that our lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. So we're looking at, we're trying to draw probable conclusions as to the meaning of this mysterious vision. And since we weren't given the words, we've been considering the comments of the pulps in this regard. When we consider the symbolism in this first passage of the vision of the third secret, we saw it calls to mind grave sin, men being driven out from the presence of God. It calls to mind the book of Revelation, the prospect that the world might be reduced to ashes by a sea of fire, the threat of divine judgment looming over the world and even of judgment day itself. It reminds us the urgency of penance, of conversion, of faith, and that it's men themselves who are preparing their own punishment, that mankind is responsible. We've seen that in his visit to Fatima, Paul VI invokes the image found in chapter 12 of the book of the Apocalypse, of the woman clothed by the sun, warns that in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, the internal peace of the church is at risk. He speaks of how evil it would be if what was intended to be a spiritual renewal of the church were somehow derailed. He refers to what we would now call the spirit of Vatican II, speaking of unauthorized interpretations that are dissolving the traditional structure and constitution of the church. He speaks of truth teachings being substituted by new teachings which are not of the faith. He speaks of a final transformation and profane mentality into worldly customs. He warns that the world is in danger and asks Our Lady for peace. Speaking of the scene that Our Lady of Fatima opens before him, the scene that he contemplates with horrified eyes. He also warns mankind to repent and believe in the gospel. Unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. We've seen that in his visits to Fatima, St. John Paul II has also spoken of the woman clothed by his son, as well as several more lines from the same chapter in the Apocalypse. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. We've seen that, among other things, these lines are a warning not to be seduced by the love of earthly things. They're a warning of martyrdom and communism. They're a warning that Satan is inside the church in the person of his apostate bishops, priests, and peoples. They are warning against lying, hypocritical, worldly minded clergy. They are warning against false teachings and changes in doctrine. We've seen that the Pope has warned us to be very, very careful to avoid all this. We've seen in the context of demonstrating that when man puts God aside, he cannot achieve happiness, but ends up destroying himself. St. John Paul II lists a whole litany of horrors of the last century. The world wars, the concentration camps and the gulags, the ethnic cleansings, the persecutions, terrorism, the attacks on unborn life and the family. We see he sums up the message of Fatima as being a call to conversion, as a warning to have nothing to do with the great red dragon. We've seen that the message directly from the apocalypse is certainly not anywhere to be found in the published parts of the message of Fatima, so presumably it comes from Our Lady's words. We've seen him he cite the exact line from the gospel used by Paul VI on his visit, repent and believe in the gospel, a line which calls to mind the cries of the angel of the flaming sword. We also considered that St. John Paul's II statement that the message of Fatima is so deeply rooted in the gospel and the whole of tradition the church feels that the message imposes a commitment on her. We asked ourselves, out of the words that are lady that have been published, what exactly is so deeply rooted in the gospel and the whole of tradition that the message imposes a commitment on the church? We've seen he states the message is addressed to every human being, to all societies, nations, and peoples, societies menaced by apostasy, threatened by moral degradation, threatened with collapse. We see that he presents himself in Fatima as a witness to the almost apocalyptic menaces looking over the nations and mankind as a whole. 
Rossini points out Our Lady cannot keep silent on what undermines the very basis of our salvation, which is our Catholic faith. And so since Our Lady cannot keep silent on what undermines this, the, the very basis of our salvation, it implies that the message of Fatima contains a warning from Our Lady regarding dangers to our Catholic faith. We've seen this undermining of our Catholic faith seems to relate to what was said about the tale of the dragon. We've seen that Pope, during Pope Benedict's 16th visit to Fatima, he speaks of willful murder, one of the sins that cries out to heaven for vengeance, and he states that mankind has succeeded in unleashing a cycle of death and terror, but failed in bringing it to an end. We've seen he speaks of the passion of the church as symbolized by the suffering Pope and the vision, and we'll return to that point later. We've seen that when he states the sufferings of the church comprise precisely from within the church, that the greatest persecution of the church comes not from enemies without, but from within, he seems to be reiterating exactly what the scriptural commentary said when treating of the great red dragon. We've seen that when in the context of a question as to whether the vision of the third secret includes the suffering of the church for the horrific sins of the sexual abuse of minors, Pope Benedict states that the church has a deep need to relearn penance, to accept purification, and the need for justice. And in response to that statement, we asked, what sort of public penance has the hierarchy of the church imposed upon themselves in reparation for all this sexual abuse, in reparation for this horrific scandal? We saw the answer was they've done no public penance. We've seen that in this country, they've excused themselves from the Dallas Accords. We've seen they can't even get themselves to admit it's a homosexual problem, in spite of the fact it's perfectly clear from their own website. We saw that Pope Benedict spoke of the need for justice and purification. We asked, keeping in mind this is another one of the sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance, what would divine justice look like in the case of the sodomitical abuse of so many altar boys? We asked what a purification like that would look like. We answered, we all know what that would look like, fire from heaven. We'll pick up right here in part two.